in front of a pile of rubble in Ukraine, a father was standing and he was being interviewed by the media. And he turned and he pointed or gestured toward this pile and said, my daughter died there. And the whole episode about Ukraine is actually, brethren, a preview of what will happen soon on a global scale. And I don't think any of us really adequately comprehend the destruction that is even now occurring in Ukraine. But it now the, the men stay home and the children and women have to flee. It's almost a reverse of what normally happens in war. So stability is really upset. But as you heard mention, if you've watched the most recent Standing Watch program by Norbert Link, you can understand that demonic forces are at work. The, the terror and the tragedy of it all is really unspeakable. It should be unspeakable, but we're going to have to cry aloud and spare not in these things as Mr. Link is doing. Trouble is coming and the Bible calls it a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation in Daniel 12. And the book of Daniel itself presents vast prophetic occurrences which will culminate in crushing havoc and ruin. Life, brethren, as we know it, will never be the chain are the same. It will forever change. What we're comfortable with right now is destined, is prophesied to be utterly decimated on a scale even larger than what's happening to Ukraine. They've moved into mass grave burials. The Bible prophesies a time for the modern house of Israel when the corpses of dead bodies will not be buried, but will rot in the streets Trouble is coming. And the question is, how are we going to handle that? Jesus also spoke of this momentous time, and I think we all very well have are familiar with this, have read about it, <clears throat> excuse me, in times past. But let's go to Matthew 24. <clears throat> verses 15 through 22, and rehearse what Jesus Christ prophesied because it was in answer to the end of the age question that his disciples posed to him about what would be the signs. And he went on even further giving events in greater detail that can only really be properly understood in our day. <clears throat> Matthew 24, excuse my voice here, I'll try to work through it. Matthew 24, verse 15, because here Christ echoes what Daniel was inspired to write. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, that is the temple, the inner chamber of the temple of God, which is yet to be built, and it goes on to say, whoever reads, let him understand. Well, we understand that a new temple will be built in Jerusalem. There will be a holy place and an abomination of desolation. A, re a foul religious leader will enter that temple. Verse 16, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. Ab you know, utter flight. We can see a comparison by what some of the people are doing in Ukraine as the bombing gets closer and closer. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And again, if you watch the news, you can see how hard it is for the mothers with young children and even newborn babies. And pray that your flight uh, let me stop right here. This instruction in verse 20 on is talking, addressing those who follow Christ. 
and pray that your flight not be in winter or on the Sabbath, for then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. And again, speaking to a group called the elect here, which would certainly include the church of God. But for the elect's sake, those days will be short and cut short. They won't run the full gamut with absolute destruction of all life. Ultimately, it comes down to this. Only God's direct intervention will save us or what is left of humanity at that point in time. Now, again, to make the point, Jesus identifies a select group and he calls them the elect. He also is specifically addressing his disciples who will be alive to witness the end of the age. Does that apply to us? Are we alive? Are we witnessing events that are moving over the threshold and into the room? I, I think so, of the end of the age. Well, that fact is emphasized by what Jesus also said, Matthew 24 and 25, verse 25. He says, see, I have told you beforehand we have information, we have knowledge, and we have to act on it for it to have any value to us. The world at large will simply not understand. They're not part of the elect. Let's go to Matthew 24, and I want to read in verse 39 to begin with. <clears throat> Christ goes on to say, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, but the Father only. But as the days of Noah were, it so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark. And did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will be the coming of the Son of Man. These scriptures that I've thus far mentioned are pointing out something that's important for us to understand. Only the very few will actually comprehend these times. And then, beyond that, act on it. For one reason or another, even some members of the Church of God, the elect mentioned in Matthew 24, will not be prepared. But they should be, and there will be consequences for those who are not ready. Now, to summarize a few things here as I continue. Regarding the end of the age coming up on us, we can see in a general way, these things, the following. The majority will simply not understand the times they're living in. That's the world out around us. Some true Christians will ignore the urgency of what is happening until it's too late. And some true Christians will indeed be watching, ready, and finding God's protection and help when trouble comes. And brethren, <laughs> prophecy promises and more appropriately warns that trouble is coming. I'm going to address this third group that I just mentioned uh, in this sermon and show how we can be, as Jesus said, in Luke 21, 36, counted worthy to escape all of these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Again, only the few, the elect, and only part of the elect initially will receive the kind of protection that is promised by God. 
Now some clarification about the elect. I'd like to go to John 17. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. An entire sermon could be built around who the elect are, but it's pretty straightforward in terms of how the Bible identifies those who are, for this time in, in the history of the world, the members of God's church. John 17 and verse 9 first. Here's what Christ said to the Father just before he was crucified. He said, I pray for them, talking about his disciples, the elect at that point. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given to me, for they are yours. Then in verse 20, Christ goes on, I do not pray for these alone, talking about the ones he was praying for, the elect of that time, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. The very words that you're hearing Sabbath after Sabbath in services, what we print and in our publications and so forth. But the elect will be hated by the world. We got just a little bit of a, a taste of that from what Mr. Rank was talking about in the announcements. Verse 16. Now I'm identifying very briefly here who the elect are. Verse 16 of John 17. They are not of the world just as I am not of the world. They walked differently than the world. Now, regarding what Jesus said, what must we be doing to be counted worthy? How can I get my ticket stamped, you might think? <laughs> it's In one hand, it's not that difficult, it is, but it's just like Mr. Rink so appropriately said in his sermonette. I, I, you know, I just don't feel like doing what it takes to be counted worthy. What a dire and, and disastrous attitude to adopt. I'm going to give you three points, uh, enlarge on the first one quite a bit. Um, certainly not everything, but this is to perhaps place us in the time setting that we're actually living in regarding what we should be doing. You know, it was real things are happening and forces and evil are going to be after us in ways that we better be ready for. But the first point that I want to give you on what we must be doing, not think about doing, not plan on doing, but be doing to be counted worthy. Number one, believe God. This is so vitally important. And it's the fulcrum of so many things in terms of where success may come. Hebrews 5 and verse 7. Because I'll start with an example of Jesus Christ. His great strength, his great action in his life was to believe God. That structured everything that he did. Hebrews 5 and verse 7, speaking of Jesus, <clears throat> it says, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears, let me stop there for just a moment, vehement cries and tears and supplications to him, to God, who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. Christ died. Did God not hear him? No. God resurrected Jesus from the dead. He saved him from death. But the intensity of what Christ 
did with his belief in God is reflected here in what is written in the book of Hebrews. Prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears. And we've all probably gone through times when we've fervently prayed to God and even shed tears and have been really intense. We're in that time now, brethren, as we don't ignore what's in front of us, but realize these are warnings, just like a weather warning that, you know, we're going to get you know, 20 inches of snow or tornadoes are about to occur or whatever else. You know, we get used to those things and we make our preparations, but at least we have the warnings and we can react. We have the, reward, the warnings about the end of the age and what's coming. We better react. Now, a, a very appropriate example is that of Noah. Noah believed God. Remember, in this first point, I'm talking about the fact that we should, we must believe God. His belief also included doing the work given to him by God. It was a witness to the rest of the world. He built an ark. He set in order his family and his service to God to complete the ark. And it came time for him to enter the ark. It was God who sealed up the ark, who kind of put the finishing touches, touches to that construction. But God both warned him and assisted him all along the way as we can read the account and, and understand. Hebrews 11 and verse 7. Hebrews 11 and verse 7. By faith, faith, believing God, believing what God had warned about the coming destruction of all life except for that which was preserved in the ark, being divinely warned of things not yet seen. Have we been divinely warned of things not yet seen? Absolutely, and we're so responsible because of that. Moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. Another example to look to here is the, the people of Nineveh. They actually, as a nation, believed God and acted accordingly. They repented with the hope that God would intervene or uh, not do what was being prophesied, at least. Jonah 3 and verse 5. Jonah 3 and verse 5. In all of these examples, it takes action. It takes activity and involvement. It's not just head knowledge. Unfortunately, I think, brethren, for the last several decades, we've been operating on head knowledge. Well, just the Lord delays his coming might be the, the thought, which is even prophesied that people would say those things. We have to live like we're in that last moment of time. Jonah 3 and verse 5, So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth, from the greatest to the least of them. I don't know of many other examples. There might be some times when the people of Judah in particular really turned as a nation to God, but Nineveh stands out as the one of the prime examples, and Christ even refers to them in his ministry. Abraham believed God, lived his life believing God, and was willing to leave his homeland and his family and go to a place that God would show him, taking all of his belongings and some of his family members with him, but 
quite an entourage if you look closely at the numbers that followed and were involved with Abraham, but in mass they moved. Because God said do this and promised him things and Abraham believed. Romans 4 and verse 3, some examples in the New Testament of how important his example is for us relative to the role and the strength of faith and how it can help us. Romans 4 and verse 3, For what does the scripture say? Well, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. He believed him, and he acted accordingly. Galatians 3 and verse 6, again, it's brought out. Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So Paul's using Abraham and a couple of examples to bring out his points. Then in James 2 and verse 3, once again, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. He became the heir of the world, as Romans 4 reveals, and he will be in the kingdom of God, as Matthew 8, 11 reveals, and other places do also. Will he be one of the elect? Well, he already is. But because he believed God, all of these blessings came to him. He answered when God called, and he responded. He didn't hold back. And some of his trials were mighty. Now, flip the coin a little bit here. Israel and Judah did not believe God. Second Chronicles 36, verses 15 through 17, for a first example here of um, Israel, the ten tribes of Israel, and what happened to them because they didn't believe God. God doesn't take that rebellion lightly, that lack of faith is not pleasing to him. So in Second Chronicles 36, I'll begin to read in verse 15. And the Lord God of their fathers sent warnings to them by his messengers, rising up early and sending them because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God, despised his words and scoffed at his prophets, until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, till there was no remedy. Too late. Sorry. You missed your shot. Therefore he brought against them the king of the Chaldeans, who killed their young men with a sword in the house of their sanctuary, and had no compassion on young man or virgin, on the aged or the weak, he gave, the, he gave them all into his hand. I think we better believe God. When, when we have understanding, we need to act on it. Daniel 9, and I'll read beginning in verse 5. In this example... I'm breaking into Daniel's petition to God here, Daniel 9, but as a leader of Judah, he's making this heartfelt prayer of repentance, not only for himself, but for the, his people. But he rehearses some things before God. Daniel 9 and verse 5. We have sinned, Daniel says, and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we heeded your name, I, I'm sorry, your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, 
to our fathers and all of the people of the land. Is a, a true message going out, a true warning going out? Who is heeding it is the question I have. It sounds just like what Daniel's writing about here. O oh Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us shame of face, as it is this day, to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, those near and those far off in all the countries to which you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness with which they have committed, which they have committed against you. They had warnings. Jeremiah warned them. Jeremiah actually presented his writings to the king of Judah, and it was promptly burned, and the book had to be written again that had been read before the king of Judah. His ending, the ending of the nation of Judah, was not very good. So here we find Daniel captive in Babylon, offering this prayer to God these years later. He goes on in verse 10, We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. We have prophets speaking to us today. They're in this book I'm reading from called the Bible. Their prophecies are as alive and as in force as the words of Jesus Christ, who was also a prophet in that sense. Matthew 23, verses 34 and 38. Not, not those two verses, but through those. Be beginning in Matthew 24, <clears throat> verse 34. Or, I'm sorry. Matthew 23, verse 34. Therefore, indeed, Christ says, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. That on you, speaking to the religious Jews in particular at this time, that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation, and they did. Their glorious temple was destroyed. Their nation was utterly devastated and was not reestablished until 1948 from 70 AD. So God's words did stand. They didn't es escape the wrath of God because they didn't repent. You know, Christians were not then and will not now be believed. I'm still talking about believing God. 1 Thessalonians 2 Verses 14 and 16 through 16. You just say that correctly. Not and, but through to verse 16. I'm having to arrange my Bible a little bit to take advantage of the light here, so bear with me. 1 Thessalonians 2, and I'll begin to read in verse 14, talking about we, the Christians, whether or not we will be as effective as we'd like to be. Well, Christ has some things to say about whether or not we will be believe, bringing his message. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God, which are in Judea in Christ Jesus for you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judean, Judeans, who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets. 
and have persecuted us, and they do not please God, and are contrary to all men, for forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. It was beginning even in that time as Rome closed in on the land of Judah, the nation. And we know the, what happened when they did not believe Jesus Christ, not knowing who he was, but rejecting him so utterly. Now, Christ makes this statement in John 15 and verse 20. You know, we bring a message. We would like to see people believe the message and respond and be saved, as Paul just was writing about in the First Thessalonians. But we're up against this reality. Remember the word that I said to you in John 15, verse 20. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will Keep yours also. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12. Talking about Christians who are trying to get people to simply believe the message that God has out there. They're not going to, brethren. They're going to reject it. Only the few will accept it. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, just as Jesus did, just as his apostles and his disciples did and have through the ages. You know, the nations will not listen to the message that's going out for the most part, but some will, and this is our, our hope our desire. Some will, and will actually become part of the Church of God. There are people in the Church of God that weren't here 10 years ago. There are more that weren't here 10 year, 20 years ago. So the Church continues to grow now incrementally compared to maybe a few decades ago. Ezekiel 3 and verse 7. This commission was given to Ezekiel, as we've been told before, Ezekiel never fulfilled it other than writing the message, but in terms of actually going to the people that he was sent to, the house of Israel and the house of uh, Judah, he didn't make it. But that has, that message is going out and it, it has been for decades. Don't what God even told Ezekiel here, but the house of Israel will not listen to you because they will not listen to me. For all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted. We see that play out in the news as social forces are closing in on us when right is totally lost. Truth has indeed fallen to the ground. It's hard to even send our young ones to school and hope that they won't be tainted or polluted by the absolute garbage that is being promoted as social norms these days. Second point I have in my sermon about how we must be acting in preparation to be accounted worthy to, to escape all of these things and to stand before the Son of Man. It's pretty straightforward here. Pray about being counted worthy. In fact, Christ himself says we should do that. Luke 21, verse 36, he adds some things. Luke 21 and verse 36, Christ says, watch therefore. Watch what? I mean, what are we supposed to be watching? Other church members? <laughs> We're supposed to be watching the fulfillment of prophecy. And of course, watch our own lives and keep those in order. But 
watch, look at all these things. This is Christian living, to be watching and to be proclaiming the message of warning that is to go out. We have to be overcoming as individuals. But there's a lot we have to do. Luke 21 and verse 36, Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all of these things. That will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. I know I've read that already in, in the, a little earlier in the sermon, but to emphasize here, watch and pray. Pray about this very thing. So I pose this question. You young people, have you ever asked God to protect you and your family in this regard? Do so. You old people, <laughs> and really old people like myself, do we do that? Do we actually pray, Father, please guide us, lead us so that we may be accounted or be counted worthy? It's important to do this in our request and prayer because we believe that God will help us, that he will hear us when we make that request. We do so in faith. Mark 11 and verse 24. Mark 11 and verse 24. Christ says, Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you will receive them and you will have them. Go with confidence, not trembling fear. And we can be emotional and, and fearing God in the right way, but not the external things that we could only be saved from if God helps us. We're in his hands in those circumstances. We are the elect. Does that seem outrageous to say that we, this tiny group of people, are part of the elect? Of course, it's bigger and there will be more, no question. The, the objective of Jesus Christ was to save mankind, to die for their sins. And we're deep into that process. Matthew 7 and verse 7. Matthew 7 and verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Seems like me that what's being presented here is some persistence, some reminding God of the things that you believe he can help him with. You stay involved with God in prayer daily and oftentimes more than once in the day. But you kind of walk about in a constant state of prayer, I mean, communicating God, thinking about God and his ways. You can't be a Christian and not do that. You have to be engaged and involved day in and day out, hour by hour. I mean, you still live your life, but God has to be the central part of your life. And that's not a burden. <laughs> that is a joy. Matthew 24 and verse 20. Here's something else we're supposed to pray about regarding being counted worthy to escape all of these things. Now, this kind of opens a broader panorama of consideration. Matthew 24 and verse 20, and pray that your flight, flight, that's fleeing like the Ukrainian people are doing, many are doing right now, and pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. Well, we know how hard it is in the winter from just seeing what's going on in Ukraine. It's going to be uh, many factors worse in the future for this nation and other nations. My third point, in what we must do, is this, watch and be ready. Matthew 24 and verse 42, and I'll read 
through verse 44. Understand the context in which this is recorded and has been included in the Word of God. It's in time prophecy, in time events for that generation upon, upon, upon whom the end of the age will come. Verse 42, watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming, but know this, that the master of the house if he had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Don't any of us allow our house of faith to be broken into by Satan or this age that we live in. Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And yet we are given knowledge that we can know the season in which he's returning. And we, like he... Christ gave the announce the analogy of the budding of a tree. We know that spring's near. We are servants in the household of God. We have been given a work to continue, and that work is a work that Jesus Christ himself started and has sustained through the millennia. And this frames what we should watch and how we should be ready. This work that we know is out there. Matthew 24 and verses 45 and 46. Matthew 24 and verse 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant in my house, God may be saying here, whom his master, when he finds, or when he comes, will find so doing. We have to continue to do the work of God until we can't. It's, and God will use us as long as it meets with his will. We heard this verse quoted already by Mr. Rank in his sermonette, James 1 and verse 25. James 1 and verse 25. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. I will say, it's my observation over the years, the decades now, that there's great joy in hearing these exciting things about the plan of God. And sometimes there was a great spirit of cooperation and involvement in doing the work of God that has become more of a scarce <laughs> attitude, unfortunately. We have to be really involved as being a part of the household of God. And it's centered on the work that's being done. The work is decided by the leadership of the ministry. And not only that, it's, it's being guided by Jesus Christ, who is the head of the church, the living head. If he wants something changed, he will change it. I want to make this point too in the context of my sermon. The work of God goes beyond the confines of the church of God. It involves a message to the world. How many times will we have heard the scripture I'm about to read? But I'll continue to read it as long as I'm able to preach and talk about this. Matthew 24 and verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. People will not like the message. And I just had a, a little bit of a preview of what's coming in the next update, and I think you're going to be shocked what Mr. Norbert Link is talking about. It's 
kind of a sea change in terms of the audience that we're addressing. But for context, I'll wait until the update comes out and he, he, they will, San Diego will be presenting services next week, so you'll hear more then. First Thessalonians 5, <clears throat> verses 4 through 6. <clears throat> Excuse me. First Thessalonians 5, verse 4. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness, which is what the world is in. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober, doing the work of God, living a life of overcoming. Uh, verse 6 actually kind of pinpoints a difference that we find in Revelation chapter 3. It's a difference between the church in Philadelphia and that of Laodicea. It, 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 it's that of being fully engaged as Philadelphia is said to be, or instead taking a nonchalant chalant attitude or approach come say, come sa, you know, the term, everything is just so-so, not really rejecting, not really accepting the truth of God and the responsibilities that go along with it. Not that on fire kind of approach to God that Christ is recorded as having in his actions as he prayed with fervency and tears because God could save him. I want to be saved. I hope I can take on that fervency, but not only myself, I want my family, my brethren, those who are the elect, who are heirs of the promise of protection. Relative to God's actions, this society at this time is willingly blind, and we, brethren, must not fall prey to the attitude that permeates it. It's the difference between obedience to God and rebellion against God. Second Peter 3, verses 1 through 4. Second Peter 3, verse 1. Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds, by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the creation of or the beginning of creation. Maybe some of you have experienced this too. You, you might talk about the return of Christ. I said, well, you know, we've been hearing that for centuries. People talk about the end is near and that Christ is going to return and we're going to be raptured or whatever their theories are. The, the Bible's very clear on the statements, the prophecies that are made. And they will stand because of the word of God. And God, for God, it's impossible to lie. So uh, Christ will return. The kingdom of God will be established on the earth as promised. But before then, we're talking, I'm talking about in this sermon, how we as the elect of God might escape the terrible times that are immediately ahead several scriptures, and I know Mr. Link has spoken on this in earlier times about 
safety in, in these coming days. And there are a lot of, there's several scriptures that you can begin to get some ideas about. Uh, but Revelation 3, 8 is kind of a key scripture in this regard. Revelation 3 and verse 8 <clears throat> Christ says, I know your works. See, I know what you're capable of doing. I know the opportunities that I've set before you. The fact that we're even getting together via this video being streamed live is simply staggering. You know, 25 years ago it would have seemed impossible to and was virtually impossible to do it at the scale we're doing now. I know your work. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Part of that is the open door of the Internet. It's been given to us. No one can shut us out. We may have to do some open field running and maneuvering, but... It will stay open as long as God wants it to stay open. And if it closes, then look out. <laughs> We're even that much more close to the end of the events that culminate in the return of Jesus Christ. Then in verses 10 and 11 in Revelation 3, we find this. Focus on this if you do nothing else in this sermon about how we can be preserved into the future. Because you have kept my command to persevere. There's a lot implied there of being obedient to God and doing his work and staying faithful and all of the other many things that we must be attending to, overcoming in particular, which is a message that is so constant in Christ's warning to his church. I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. The implication of that 11th verse is, in terms of holding fast, that this is a message for the end of the age church of God, at least one part of it here. But it's Christ saying here, I also will keep you from the hour of trial. Brethren, when trouble comes, how can we be, as Jesus said, counted worthy to escape all of these things that will come to pass and to stand before him? The answer is very straightforward, and it is from Jesus Christ. It's at the end of every message to every church in Revelation 2 and 3. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's make sure that we are hearing the message of Jesus Christ relative to the times we're living in and the times that are out ahead of us. Do that, and we will be counted worthy. And we can believe in that and have confidence that God also will do his part along with us doing our part.